Uh, I think we're going to have some fun today. Um, so I, I'm, I'm here to talk about this idea of programming the web. A lot of us program machines. If we were just looking at Dave's talk today, you know, Dave was talking a lot about the way we think about programming a machine or a set of machines. Um, the challenge I set forth for myself many years ago was how do I program everyone else's machine? How do I use everyone else's machine to help me uh, solve a problem or create a solution? So I created this thing called the uh, Hyper CLI, and um, I thought I would uh, give you a little taste of what the Hyper CLI is like. Greetings, Professor Falcon. Would you like to play a game? How about a nice game of hypermedia? Does anybody get the reference, I'm wondering? Am I too old? Okay, maybe later. That is actually, that is actually a tape of, of the application itself, and we'll get to see a whole lot more of it here in just a little bit. If I stop it here and move forward, there we go. So uh, obviously that first part is a reference to war games. I thought since we were talking about AI and so many other things, I thought I needed to add this a little at the start of my talk. In war games, we were worried about a computer that could blow us all up. Now we're just worried about a computer that can chat us to death, right? It's basically kind of how we've progressed in the last 30 or 40 years. It's so like in the 1980s. Um, um, this is me. This is how you find me on LinkedIn and GitHub and Mastodon and Twitter and all those things. I would love to connect with you. I would love to learn what you're working on, what you're thinking about, uh, what's a challenge for you. Most of the stuff I end up talking about and writing about are things that I've learned from other people. So this would be a great chance for me to learn from you. I'm always, always happy to get connected. Uh, the latest book that I just completed uh, at the start of this year, I think it was released at the end of last year, is this a book by uh, Anne O'Reilly. It's on patterns and practices. It's actually a cookbook. If anyone's seen O'Reilly cookbooks, they're something more detailed than a, than a pattern and less detailed than actual code. It's kind of an in-between kind of thing. Uh, and in order to do a bunch of the things in this book that I've, been, I've worked on it for the last couple of years, I needed to create a client application to help me program services. And that's what the Hyper CLI really is. So what I'm showing you is what I had to kind of build to figure out how to write the stuff I was talking about. So um, this is the first time I've, I've actually given a talk on this tool. I've used this tool now for a little over two years. Uh, it's still very much a proof of concept. It's sort of like my cobbled together bits and pieces, but it's really taught me a lot about how I think about things and how I'd like to get other people to think about it. So, so I thought I would share with you the process, what's going on, and maybe get some ideas, some feedback. So. Um, there's some basics I want to cover. There's some additional things about the difference between the language and the interface. And then a little bit about futures, things that I think need to be done, but I'm not sure how to go about doing them. I'm going to move this so I can get to the keyboard a little better. So first of all, welcome to Hyperworld. This is a crazy part of my brain. Um, it's influenced very much by the HyperCard system that was released for Apple many decades ago. Has anybody seen or even heard about HyperCard before? So HyperCard, before we had the uh, popularity of the internet and links and the web and so on and so forth, um, I can't remember the person, his name is escaping me at the moment, wrote this thing in, uh, called HyperCard where you could actually have like a card and then you could place connections to other cards on it. You could actually program using cards and symbols and links. And it was actually a very, very cool technology. Was, you might even think of it, I guess it might, might have been a low code, no code kind of solution. But this was 40 years ago and they became very, very popular. People wrote games and all sorts of applications. You could do storage and recall and so on and so forth. Uh, they weren't connected across originally. They were just they were just for one machine. So it was programming one machine. So a lot of what I'm thinking of is, was uh, influenced by HyperCard. Um, so Hyper in, in the Hyper world that I that I've been working on for the last couple of years, it really has two parts. It's a it's a REPL, and I think the very next talk in this room by Avdi Grimm is kind of a talk about the 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 beauty and greatness of 
of uh, these REPL, these restore and print loop kind of, evaluate and print loop kind of things. Um, so this REPL is a lot like curl. Has anybody used curl before? So it's a curl, but a bit more. So it's curl with memory. So in this case, it, when, you start the, when you start the Hyper CLI, it actually has a session. So every time you visit a page, it actually remembers the response and all the metadata in a stack. And you can go and call those back. You can use the response from one web, website. You can take content from that page and then pipe that to another website if you want to. So it's a bit like that. And there are some other things as well. Curl does uh, OAuth and a bunch of other things relatively easily. Um, or, or CLI does. So the CLI is actually hosting a thing called, I call Hyperlang, which is a DSL for programming the web. It actually makes it a lot easier. You can actually talk HTTP. You can do all the things that you normally would with HTTP, like on a URL and a body and a method and so on and so forth. But if you're dealing with uh, services that actually send you things like forms and links with labels and names, you can just program the names. Most of the examples you'll see that I'll show you, I have one initial start URL, and then the rest of the time I go to all sorts of places and never use a URL again. I actually use the URLs that are sent on the page. So I'll say, using the link with the ID so-and-so, do this, and so on and so forth. It's even smart enough to fill in a form. So take all the stuff I have in my memory and fill in this form, and then submit that form using the method they tell you to use. So it's a bit like programming, but without a little bit of the pain. It's not really low code, no code, because you really still have to write code. So what does the REPL look like? The REPL, um, I have some screenshots of this, and then I'll, I'll dip in and out, so this might get a little confusing. But it, it's basically, um, you start the thing with a single command, and then you can start writing statements. Uh, when you get a request back, you can actually see the entire request. You can scroll in and out of it. You can actually do some XPath or JPath queries against uh, the item as well. Um, you can uh, inspect responses like where are the items, where are the links, what is the ID or the name of the property. It's also aware of formats. So if it's using HTML, you can use HTML tags. If it's using HAL or collection JSON or Uber or Mason or, or forms.json or whatever the case, it sort of knows what each of those means. So you can say, give me all of the links on this page or give me all the forms or give me, give me the form that's for updating and so on and so forth. Um, so I can, see, I can see metadata at the top of the page. I can see links as well. And it even has a stack, as I had mentioned before. So if I visited four different sites, I might have a stack of four um, responses that I can then manipulate as well. So let's just, let's just take a look at this here. So as I would said before, all right, so this is the current version. Let's see, I'm going to call, so if I can remember this company. All right, so then I got a completed statement. Now I can say, uh, show me that uh, statement, but it's pretty long. It's kind of hard to do. Uh, what I can do instead is, um, let's see, show request or metadata. Okay, so I, here's my headers. Uh, let's see, okay, so it's forms JSON, so I can say F, um, FJ Items. Let's see if like, this works. Uh, this one item is pretty long. Let's see. Um, yeah. So there's a there's a list link, right? So I can actually say call with ID list. Right, and then it actually gives me back the list, the total list of all of the records in the collection. I can do the same thing again, which is just a show and gives you a long, long list of those. Whoops. I'm actually going to use a, a slightly different helper that'll actually make it easier for me to scroll back and forth. I have a little script here. Um, and let's call it company.
All right. So this actually lets me run scripts as well. So I wrote this little script that says I want to just visit that same site. Notice I can actually use configuration files as well. So I actually have custom configurations that I can, I can use. And then I get the answers back. And then there's the answer back that I got from that original page. So this page tells me I've got a handful of things that I can look at, home, list, so on and forth, and any links like that. So I can start to manipulate uh, sites as if I was just kind of, pro kind of programming them. Let me go back and show you a little bit more about how the DSL works. So this is a DSL. I doubt anybody has seen this DSL before because it's from the 1950s. It's actually a language called Flowmatic. Flowmatic is the precursor to COBOL. Flowmatic was created before as, as sort of the example of how COBOL would work. And it was created by this person, Grace Hopper, uh, in the 1950s. I love this quote from her. I've always been more interested in the future than in the past. And that kind of drove her. Grace was involved in a lot of the early designs of mainframe computers and computer programming languages. And one of the things that um, Hopper wanted to do was she wanted to create a programming language that was more like spoken word, more like spoken English in this particular case, because she thought that that's the way we would be programming computers in the future. We would be talking to them or we would be writing them in simple sentences, not using variables and all sorts of other crazy things. Uh, eventually, like I said, Flowmatic becomes COBOL, and COBOL was actually a big influence on how I wanted to design the Hyperlang as well. I wanted the Hyperlang to seem like you were actually speaking a kind of an understood language between, between parties, rather than something like C or C Sharp or Java or all that kind of stuff. By the way, apparently, this language will never go away is a huge, uh, huge need right now for people to maintain programs that are now half a century old. And they run tons and tons of our, our daily lives, especially at the government level. So there are almost every state in the union, things like your, your, pay, your social payments and your taxes and all sorts of other things are all dependent on COBOL. So it's not going away anytime soon. So when you look at Hyperlang, it actually, this is a little bit hard, we'll see some other slides on it, but it actually looks a lot like the same idea of Flowmatic and COBOL, it's where you actually kind of speak in a kind of a, a, a clear sense of term. So you can speak very direct uh, HTTP, right? So I can say, I want to do this with a method and with some data and I can set headers and all sorts of other things like that. And then I can do the same thing with responses. There's all sorts of things I can do with responses. I can inspect certain parts of them. I can actually use path queries to, to look at individual elements and part of that as well. So uh, let's look at some other examples here. Now that I've got this going here, let's see. So we saw the first one where I was just doing the simple company. Let's do a filter. So in this particular case, what I want to do is I want to actually filter the records that I, get, uh, that I get back. So I make that call using the company and then I say, all right, I want to get that list. Give me the list. And then in the next step, I actually say, I want to use the form called filter and fill it in with anything I have in memory, that stack memory. So you can see up here what I actually did is I added a company name, all right? So, what happens, you'll see when I get the example here, is this is where I'm actually making the call for the actual filter. It actually creates, uh, fills out the query line, right? So I didn't have to say anything about what method to use or use a query string or anything. I just said using the form that they gave me, make, execute that request. And then I actually just look for that, for that one record in the system. Um, so this ability to actually load the stack comes in pretty handy because it lets me start to modify things as well. So let me look at another example here. Let's see. Give me a second here. Okay. Um,
Oh, I guess that's pretty much the same thing. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm looking for a different one here. Oh, okay. So in this particular case, I, I know I'm getting this forms.json object back, and I can use custom terms that actually know what forms.json uh, objects mean. I could do this for HTML, I could do it for HAL. There's a bunch of uh, formats that I could use. And so I can say, give me the links, give me the forms, give me whatever you have on a particular page. So that's the metadata there. There's the links. And there's the list of forms. So it knows it has all these different forms on it. I can actually modify my application just by calling those particular forms. Let's look at one more here. No. Oh. So I can be very specific as well. I can write very HTTPE looking kind of stuff, right? With this URL, with this method, and with this query string, do, these, do the following things, right? So even if I have a language or a, a server that doesn't actually return very rich messages, doesn't actually give me lots of links and forms in it, I can actually still script out lots and lots of interaction. And I can do that, um, you know, um, with, with variables, so I can use configuration files. One of the things I do is I actually use this tool to run a lot of uh, interface tests for APIs. So I can write a whole bunch of tests, make queries for you know, 200 OK or 400 OK, and then just change configuration. So I can actually point at a live server, or I can point at uh, a, a, a mounted server in test, or I can point at my local server just by changing a single configuration. So it's pretty straightforward. All right. By the way, if I say something and you want to ask a question, go right ahead. We got lots of time here. There's not a lot of people in the room, so. All right, so that gives us a sense of what it's like. What, what, is, what does it actually look like? So we've saw, we saw some of these already. Calling is really simple. And by the way, there's, there's lots, of, uh, lots of synonyms I can call, go to, request. And it's all the same kind of thing. And I can just write a direct URL. Uh, and I have it set so that it doesn't automatically uh, spit the entire contents to me. Uh, that's just a verbosity mode. Um, I'm just looking, most of the time, I'm just looking for 200 OK. I kind of know what I'm supposed to be accomplishing, and hopefully I'll get there. Uh, but you can do that as well. We saw this idea of using a query where it writes out the query string. And that's one of the actual magical things about the, the, the CLI, is it knows enough about HTTP to know that queries go in the query string, or that forms have values, and that forms have methods, and forms take certain formats so that writing responses back in formats are really important as well. Um, this idea of using the configuration is, is pretty handy and using a method. Um, the idea of using names or IDs or RELs is also possible as well. And that's really handy when you don't really know for sure what the layout of a particular message is uh, or what the particular workflow is. Uh, one of the things I found when I got in the habit of doing this is you can really you can start to rely on certain patterns like go to the go to home and look for the list you know, list operation and then c execute the list operation and go to see if there's an add operation and execute the add operation with the d the data that you have and so on and so forth. And you can go step by step without really knowing the layout where it is on the page. Sometimes even without even knowing what the format is, because it'll just kind of uh, figure it out as you go. Um, filter with call with form. Filter with stack is a really powerful uh, uh, gesture in this kind of language because I can just remember things and put them on the stack. And I can even use uh, loops and scripting so that what happens is I can load the stack, execute it, clear the stack, load the stack, execute it, clear it. Or I can actually load 50 things on the stack and just loop over and over again and, and finish each one of those elements until they're done. So you might ask, <laughs> Am I trying to program using HTTP? Is this a good idea? Do we want to do this? Isn't there, aren't there better languages? In fact, I really like using HTTP for a handful of reasons. Um, one of the biggest reasons is that almost everybody is already using it. I don't have to convince you to use a certain tool or a certain library or module. I'm not limited to a certain programming languages, uh, all that kind of stuff. 
So HDDP was originally designed to be very uh, loosely coupled, right? So probably the definitive version of that loosely coupled thinking uh, was from Roy Fielding in 2000, this idea of rest, right? So rest is still around. It's amazing to me that after 20 plus years, it still can be very, very effective. Um, he talked about this notion of how computers would be connected and no computer needed to see any further than the next link in the chain. One of the things that uh, Thomas talked about today was this idea of 100% uh, test coverage, right? We have this notion, a lot of us think about the idea, if I could test everything, I'd be all set. Well, of course, on the internet, that's not true because things change all the time, right? I really like what Dave's message was, that, you know, make it easier for things to change. And a lot of what Fielding was talking about 20 years ago was this notion that you can't really control what other people are doing. So you have to, you have to survive in some kind of way. So he really thought of this notion of how we interact with each other and how we can sort of come up with a set of principles that allow us to, no matter what the language, no matter what the platform, no matter what the distance, uh, we can build part of this network that will never go down. The web, the internet, whatever you want to think of, uh, is pretty solid. And just about any service can be expressed using HTTP as well, which is one of the things I really like about this notion of HTTP. Because it's loosely coupled, it's really just an interface. I'm just sending you a message and you're sending me a message and then I'm looking at the message and sending you a message. So there are lots and lots of things. There are APIs for gaming, there are APIs for banking, there are APIs for insurance systems, there are APIs for healthcare. All of these organizations are working on rather domain specific uh, platforms so that they can actually create APIs that other people would interact with. So that means that if you can program in HTTP, if you can think about the APIs as your interface, then you're actually ahead of the game. You can actually interact with more than one service at one time. And as I had mentioned before, technically HTTP never crashes. Services do, services on the net do, and you have to kind of design for that. But HTTP itself uh, runs just fine. Uh, Alan Kay has talked about this in a handful of different ways, and um, uh, I, I like this idea where he talks about the internet was done so well, most people think of it as a natural resource like the Pacific Ocean rather than something that was invented by humans, which I really think is true. We kind of, we assume, like wherever I land, wherever I go, I assume I'm going to have some internet. And I think that's a pretty amazing thing, and it's really based on the notion uh, of being successful, of surviving dumb people, right? I, you know, it's really hard for me to crash the internet. It's easy for me to crash a device, like to crash a router or something like that, but the internet itself is pretty powerful and pretty, pretty sustaining, and HTTP makes, takes a great advantage of that internet space. And this is the thing we talked about earlier. Smart clients can compose multiple services into a single solution. I can read a little from this insurance site and read a little, little bit from this medical site and then maybe give uh, some people some insight or understanding into how their uh, medical application's going or how their insurance claim is going and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of things we can do and the nice thing is the services don't need to know I'm doing that. Right? And I can interact with, the, with an HL7 server for medical, and I can interact with an Accord server for insurance. Those insurance and medical servers don't need to talk to each other, they talk to me. I can write that, and I can write that in HTTP. So this goes back to, this is uh, Roy Fielding. Notice that this is, this is right around the same time as the Alan Kay statement, right? This is a couple years later. Uh, and Roy is, is in this statement, I really think he's kind of answering to Alan Kay a little bit. Alan Kay actually, um, the, the rest of the quote that was in that Alan Kay quote was, the internet, has anybody built anything is, is, that has been so great as the internet? And then the very next statement he says, the web, that's a piece of crap. Because he's upset about the way the web was implemented. And in a way, Roy is talking about this. Roy was trying to figure out how you could sort of uh, turn that, that web experience, that web intuition into something that's a little bit more stable. He said he had to define a system that could withstand decades of change produced by people spread all over the world. And he leaves out people who don't know each other, people who aren't working on the same project together, 
being able to add and remove things at any time of the day. One of the, one of the principles in the book that I worked on for this, with using this particular tool, is this idea of, in many ways, we are creating solutions. We're, we're creating systems to solve problems we haven't thought of, right? I haven't thought of all sorts of ways you could do a game, but you could do a game in a web interface, right? We're, we're trying to make it possible to solve problems we haven't thought of for people we have never met, right? Across the world, people that I will never meet. I'm trying to build something that they might be able to understand, whether or not they like it or use it, it's another thing, but just so that they can understand it. Oh, that's an interesting thing. That's a super, super challenging element to me. And that's really what Fielding talked a lot about, and that's what Alan Kay talked about a lot as well. So I think this idea of programming um, using HTTP is pretty powerful. Now this is an example of actually creating uh, a, a new entry, a new record on a server, and there's one line here, uh, this one right here, call with form, create company with stack. That's the whole process, right? The rest of this is all just setups. There's some memory, there's finding, getting to the right place where I get to the list where I know there's that create company. There's actually, there's actually a pattern I talk about in the book where you can actually publish a page where it tells you where all the links are. It's sort of like an index page, but we didn't, we didn't have that for this particular service. So all I do is I create that record and then I look to see if I, if I actually get the result. And I can actually even update that same record as well. In this case, I'm looking for a record called Go to Chicago that didn't have its proper telephone number, and I insert that. Let's let's take a look at how that works. Yep. Okay, so. Here, I'm setting up a stack, which just has a bunch of values in it. And that's when I actually call the record right there. I call the stack. So the results are, one of the interesting things here is, I load the stack right there, I make the call, and then I get the results back. And I, I asked for one item, the item has a lot of uh, links in it, but when you get down to the bottom, there it is. Now you notice the telephone number is missing, right? Telephone number is missing. So what we need to do is we need to actually edit that record to put the telephone number in. And this will show something else that we get here. All right, so in this case, we start with the telephone being empty. Let me go back up to the top here and show you how we're gonna go about doing this. This line here actually pushes part of the message onto the stack. So it says, I want to push onto the stack the first item in the list, all right? So now that's in memory, whereas before I wrote it out, now I just pushed it in memory from that particular record. Now, while it's in memory, I can change memory. So now I'm going to change the telephone number to the new number, and then I just simply execute the same step again. But I'm using a different form, I'm using the update form. Notice I don't know what method that is. Is that put? Is that patch? Is that post? I don't care. They told me the details, right? So then that's what happens at the end. So I get down to the bottom and ta-da, magical, magical. You're surprised. I am kind of uh, that it worked. Um, so now I can start modifying records. I can start reading records that I haven't seen before, put them in memory, and then start manipulating them, and then put them, I could have put them to another server as well, right? The other thing that's really uh, handy is the, the REPL is smart enough, if I have like 30 things in my memory, and this form only takes five, it just takes the five. All right, it says fine, I, I found what I'm looking for, that's just fine. So I can actually build up a profile, you can think about, Think about social media. So I, I do a lot of posting to various social media sites. So I keep a, a, a bunch of profile content um, that's for multiple sites, but I can run the same script and it, it uses the, the right authentication and so on and so forth for a particular page every time I need it. So um, I can load up a lot of things and carry them around with me and it's sort of like my wallet. 
It's like a little handy kit. Oh, I got that for you. I can hand that to you. I can hand that to you. And so on and so forth if you ask for it. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. By the way. Yes. Anybody still support soap services? Nobody will admit it. Oh, somebody will admit it. Okay, very good. So yeah, I can do soap services as well. Now this is a bit of a hack because actually I'm talking just HTTP language to this machine. But as we'll see in a little bit, um, a lot of these uh, format supports are actually done through extensions, through plugins. Writing a plugin for this tool is very, very easy. So um, I, I thought actually that my goal for today was to actually write the soap plugin, but that WSDL is damn hard. <laughs> So, so I kind of gave up. <laughs> so I just I did a hacky version of it. But this is a case where I'm actually calling a SOAP service in XML, uh, trundling the XML to find the thing I'm looking for, filling in the data, and then getting the answer back. All right. So that gives you a sense of some of the things that are possible. Let's talk about some of the extension bits here. So we can definitely support OAuth, and it supports basic auth as well. Uh, Supporting OAuth is another real challenge. How many people have had to write out support for OAuth before? All right, it's like, there isn't one OAuth. There's dozens. Um, my, my wife is Italian and there's a, there's a joke in Italy uh, about uh, uh, the recipe for a pasta sauce. How many recipes are there for pasta sauce? It's the same number of mothers there are in Italy. It's like the same thing for OAuth. How many recipes for OAuth? It's like every site has their own little version of it. Some use headers, some use uh, uh, the query string, some use forms, some use a combination, some use some crazy uh, thing that you've got to kind of like, you know, kind of compose yourself. It's just really nutty. So what I did is I wanted to make this relatively easy. Uh, so writing the OAuth plugin took some challenge, but I got it kind of reduced down to a pretty simple for format. And then we'll talk about writing plugins, and I'll show an example of writing a plugin really quick. And of course, there are lots of scripting. I've shown you some stack and some config. There's some memory. There's some other things as well. So actually, um, the hyperlink has a term called define, which lets you define a profile. So when you are pulling up your OAuth profile, they give you things like your secret and your ID and uh, a couple of other values that you're supposed to carry around with you. You can define a block uh, in, in memory for that. And then you can generate a fresh token. So if I just say OAuth generate and give the token name, it'll go out to that, uh, that website, whatever the endpoint is supposed to be, uh, pass the credentials, the secret and whatever, an ID, and then it'll get back a valid token. And then keep that token in memory. And then you can say, when you're making a request, you can say with OAuth and then the token name. So now you don't have to do the extra interactions. This works great for headless kind of applications. So it sends the encoded header. So this is a little bit of what it looks like ahead of time. OAuth define, so you can see, um, yeah, you can see it here. So I define the URL and the secret and the content type, and there might be uh, um, other, other elements. Some organizations have, have lots of different elements. Then I actually do the configuration. So I have to force load OAuth. It doesn't automatically load it. Force load, generate the key, make the call, and again, Way down on the end over there, it says with OAuth dev exchange, right? And then I can do whatever else I want to do. Do I want to get the product names that my ID had access to? And then I actually clean up the file. So this, this is sort of the output of that. So uh, again, that should be in this list. Yep. Now, sometimes that first generate takes a little bit of time. Let's see if it uh, worked. Yes, it did. So this is, the, this is my answer back. This, this is when I made the call, right? And you can see over here the uh, OAuth exchange. So all I need to know, uh, that generate statement, by the way, actually calls to the website, passes data in whatever forms or links are necessary, and gets, gets the token back and saves the token. And let's see if I did it here. Did it? Oh, yeah. So this is what the actual authorization header looks like when I, when I send it, right here. This is the one, this is the token I got. Um, now, I kind of, I'm kind of lazy right now. I actually do a refresh token just about every request, but there's a way you can cache some of that and, and interact that. It just needs a little bit more work. 
on that particular um, plugin. So let's see what else we got here. Um, so yeah, we saw that as well. So you can do basic auth as well with this tool. Um, I use basic auth a lot on my internal stuff and I work with organizations that still do a lot of basic auth internally. So it's pretty easy, it's the same thing. You don't have to worry about generating uh, a token with this. Um, so you can just say with basic, you can see where it says with basic here, and just pass the, uh, that's the name of the profile and it'll do the name and all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the things I'd really like to do is Amazon authentication. Because Amazon, of course, they invented their own. And it's a, but it's a pretty tedious thing. So most people just use libraries. I built a library years ago, but I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> so that's another thing that's sort of on the list. I was really hoping, again, to say AWS authentication, which would be really cool. All right, let's talk a little bit about plugins. So I really built this app hoping to be kind of a, a, a sort of a bootstrappy kind of uh, system where you could write a, write a plugin in Hyperlang, but I couldn't, I couldn't really kind of pull that off in the first pass of it. There's a language called Forth. Does anybody know the language called Forth? Forth, where you basically use Forth to write Forth. It's pretty cool, but I'm not that smart. Um, all of the Hyperlang features can, uh, are available to plugin authors. So all of the memory stack, the OAuth, all of those kinds of things are available for free if you're writing a plugin. Uh, and it loads plugins automatically. You just drop these JS files, these Node.js files in a folder, and at startup, it'll actually just, just load them right up, which makes them terribly handy, and what's the other thing it makes them? Terribly dangerous. I resisted using the eval statement, but I did make it possible to just create any kind of plugin you wanted. Uh, so first of all, plugins are sort of on a, on a, on a slightly different path in the, in the engine. So you can see, um, you can ask for what plugins are available right now. These are all the plugins that are currently available. Um, so they'll just automatically go out and look for all of those files and say, yes, we have those, those are available. And uh, this happens to be just the plugin help file for uh, one, uh, the help file for one particular plugin. It's kind of a man style, but it's, it's, it's cut back a little bit. You literally just write, write the text. So one of the things, this is, not a, this is not a Turing complete language, it's very specific, but one of the things it doesn't do is math, but you could build a math plugin, right? A simple math plugin and using especially that COBOL-ish language nature. So this one I did manage to do last night. So you can create a, a math plugin, which then allows you to use statements to actually do functions. This is actually the help file for, for the math plugin here. So let me see if I can uh, pull that off. Let's see. Okay, come on. Hmm, okay. This will be trickier than I thought. We got 10 minutes. We'll, 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 we'll try that later. It, it does work, but I'm gonna have to go to a different directory. So this, this is the actual evidence, so you can do a multiplication and division and so on and so forth. Uh, doing it in runtime means I got to change folders and that's dangerous for me typing up here. So I talked about scripting already. So it's actually built to use pipes, which makes it very handy for integrating in lots and lots of other tools. So you can pipe in scripts, and you can pipe out the output, and you can pipe that into other tools. So I had, I had started with the idea of, of thinking that I might need to do things like loops or other things. Actually, I end up using bash scripting and other things to do most of my looping and other sophisticated workflow stuff. So I just kind of mix and match it. But it, it would be handy if it did some of it itself. We also have some, sh uh, some shell commands as well. There are lots of ways to start hyper. You saw in the beginning, I just typed a hyper command and that gave me the REPL directly and then I could interact with that. Sort of like the way you do with Node and Python and Ruby and lots of stuff like that. You can also send a list of statements directly to it on the command line. So if I just say hyper and say call this and then show me the items, it'll execute that right away and just make that as output so you can, you can pipe that output if you want to. You can also pipe in a script. So you can just say, hey, here's a script. I wrote all this stuff out, just go ahead and run this script. And you can then, of course, pipe the output of that script to something else. And the output of the script does not have the actual execute commands, it just has the output, so it's safe to use in other tools. 
Um, there's a configuration system. There's lots of things you can do with config files. You, there's a default config file that's loaded when you start, but you can name configs and save configs. So you can actually write again scripts that basically say, I want you to load the shopping config and do the following things and so on and so forth. You can use config files to do all sorts of things. You can also uh, store uh, block objects, uh, multi-nested objects in config. It doesn't really matter. The stack is actually pretty cool, but it's a bit of a challenge. So it is a, it is a push down stack, a push down pop off stack. So you have to kind of keep track of where things are. Uh, I don't have stack manipulation like rotation and some other things, but it's something that would be relatively easy to do. Again, you can also save stacks and load stacks uh, over and over again if you want to. You can actually load a stack uh, multiple times, load different stacks multiple times. So here's, here's a little, little test. I'm going to push two things on the stack. First, a localhost URL, then an external URL. So when I call with URL to make a call to the company URL, which place am I going to first? If I make a call now, what will I get back? What's that? The company. And in fact, that's right, right? Because it's the top of the stack. And then I can pop that off, and then I can call the other one, All right? So this, again, gives me lots of chances to do things like testing or change directions, or, or you know, I can do A-B testing. There's lots of stuff that I can do with the stack. And, there, and I can, again, save the stack, and I can port the stack. I can ship the stack as a package. So if you've already got Hyper, I can ship things like uh, stacks and configs. I can even ship uh, authentication, environment variables, environment uh, files. So it's pretty easy to package something up. And you can have a pretty extensive script. You can call lots of activities. I didn't get a chance to do it here because uh, we're running out a little bit out of time, but you can actually call multiple sites and interact with each other. Um, you can do echo statements, all kinds of other things like that. Okay. So what about the futures? What is pos what, where are we now and what's possible? So it's definitely still at proof of concept. It's pretty resilient, but you can crash it. It doesn't take a lot. Um, it'll ignore you quite often. It'll just say, okay. Okay, I didn't do anything, but okay. Uh, we, need, we got some key, key features and I need to expand a few things. So we really need to harden the code. It really needs some, some, some serious effort. Uh, it needs some improved error handling. The, the most common error handling is simply ignoring it. Uh, every once in a while, it'll tell you you're missing something, but it's not really good at that. Uh, it's also, like any proof of concept, it just got rangier over time. It's like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit of a rat's nest. It needs to be modularized a little bit. Um, it needs to be modularized because right now, th there isn't an object model, right? So without an object model, it's hard to you embed this tool into other tools, which I'd really like to be able to do. So um, in implementing a sort of a, a, a module library so that I can just say, you know, get an instance of the hyperlang, and then you can, you can start to send scripts to the hyperlang within your own application. Like if you're an editor, right, you've got an editor tool, you can press F5 and send the script and execute it. Or if you want to actually have a, a more sophisticated document object model, all of the various things of the language might be available as part of the document object model. That will make plugins pretty hard because plugins are dynamic, so you can't really know all of it. That's going to have to be kind of an extended model, but it can be done. I have some exit ifs kind of situations, which is a lot of the way HTTP works. You know, HTTP doesn't have loops, it's just executes. Uh, but a better if then, a better repeat would be pretty handy. Um, more plugin support internally. There are a few things that, uh, that don't quite work really well more format driven, but especially more domain centric languages. Like I focused on document languages like HAL and Collection JSON and Uber and Mason, but you could, you could write a PSD2 plugin. So you would speak PSD2 talk, right? And it would know to do the authentication. It would know what accounts or account objects are and so on and so forth. You can do a cord for insurance. You can do HL7 for health. There are dozens and dozens of these domains that are creating API libraries, and you can make that part of a plugin as well. So 
It's a DSL programming platform, actually. You basically get to write some of your own DSLs. I started with sort of the, 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 the core, but in user land, you can do all sorts of things. Um, you can, it's all focused on the idea of HTTP. I thought about the notion of what it would take to do something like event-driven, but it, that makes it really hard to make it a command line tool because you got to do wait states and some other things like that are kind of challenging. You've already got pretty decent security. We could do more. We need more plugins, and there's lots of scripting possibilities. It's a lot of integration with the OS would help as well. So more modules, other languages, right? It's written in, in, in Node and available as an NPM element, but man, if you could do this in Python or Ruby or Java or C or C Sharp or something like that, you can get some pretty powerful tooling out of this. That means a much better set of documentation on the language and how the, how the internal model works. It's actually a pretty simple model it's, it's, it's giant, you know, if, uh, it's giant where, when, kind of, you know, while, kind of loops is really all it is. Back to the days of the original C language. So, this, this is something that's always touched me. I tried to write this so it was easy to modify, and it, it goes right to what Dave was talking about earlier today. The best software architecture knows what changes and makes that easy. Making it easy was Dave's whole theme today. So um, I just want to give that as a shout out as well. And that's what I've got. I thank you very much.